All right. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this 12th episode of the Sarasota Bay Deep Dive Series, where we interview people whose work has positive impacts on Sarasota Bay. My name is Darcy Young. I work for an organization called the Sarasota Bay Estuary Program uh, right here in Sarasota, Florida. And our mission is to restore and protect estuaries from Anna Maria Sound down to the Venice Inlet. Thanks so much for joining us today. Um, my guest for this 12th uh, deep dive episode is Dr. Randy Wells, who is the program director of the Chicago Zoological Society's Sarasota Dolphin Research Program. It's a collaborative partnership dedicated to dolphin research, conservation, and education. Welcome, Randy. Hey, Darcy. How are you doing? Great, thanks. Thank you so much for joining me today. My pleasure. Um, and welcome to our audience as well. Thank you for joining us too. Um, we're going to have time for most of your questions at the end of the interview, but um, I'd like to welcome you to chime in with those questions anytime, just using the chat function on the video, whether you're on Facebook or YouTube, you should be able to do that. Um, so with that, um, Randy, I'm excited to jump into our discussion today, and I'll ask you to kick it off for us by telling us a bit about your background and how you got involved with dolphin research. Sure. And can we go ahead with the slides at this point? We can. All right. There so first of all, what I want to do is make clear that I'm here today as a representative of a, of a team. We've got a wonderful team of staff members and students and volunteers that do the actual work here in Sarasota Bay. And I'm the old guy who's been around the longest, so I get to talk about it today. I've been with this program now since 1970, since its inception. We have become by default, the world's longest running study of a wild dolphin population, just because nobody else started back when we did and kept it going since that time. So our team is based here in Sarasota Bay for the most part, and we're based out of the Moat Marine Laboratory. We do our work throughout the Bay, but we got our start many years ago when Moat Marine Laboratory was down at the southern end of Siesta Key. And the fellow that I came to work with at that point as a high school volunteer, Blair Irvine, was doing research on shark-dolphin interactions. And as along with that, he brought an interest in what wild dolphins did. So he actually initiated the idea of tagging dolphins in local waters to see where they go. Back then, nobody knew where they went, where they spent their time, uh, who they spent their time with. They could be all the way across the Gulf of Mexico at some point. So back in 1970, Blair went out with a local dolphin collector and started putting tags on dolphins. And I got to tag along with him as his assistant while I was in high school at Riverview. So we started tagging dolphins in 1970. The tags didn't stay on very long, but the fins were marked at that point so we could keep track of the individuals. And we began to get a hint of dolphins remaining resident to the area. And that set the stage for everything else. Once we learned that dolphins didn't move around that much, at least in the Sarasota Bay area, we then could engage in a variety of other studies. And it led to my master's research and to my PhD research, uh, learning more about the dolphins in Sarasota Bay. So now the work has evolved over the decades. Now that we're in our fifth, moving into our sixth decade soon, the work has evolved to, involve, to incorporate a number of different kinds of research activities. Most basic is keeping track of each of the individual dolphins in the bay through monthly surveys using photographs to tell individual fins apart. We also periodically engage in capture release health assessments to try to understand what's going on with the animal's health and their life history. Seasonally, we conduct fish surveys of Sarasota Bay to try to understand the prey base and how that then affects the biology and behavior of the dolphins. We use purse staining to do that. We engage in focal animal behavioral follows to understand systematically how the dolphins are, are behaving at any given time and relating that to various parameters such as age and sex, uh, relationships and human, human activities. We also have established a system of passive acoustic listening stations around the bay so that we can monitor the biological sounds in the bay as well as the sounds of the dolphins and the sounds of boats in the area. And my understanding is you're gonna be hearing more about that at a later program here. That's right. And then we work very closely with Moat Marine Laboratory Stranding Investigations Program so that we bookend these animals. We study them from the time they're born Moat studies them when they die, and between us, we get a better understanding of what it takes to be a dolphin in Sarasota Bay and what kind of factors are affecting their ability to thrive and survive. 
So it's, it gives us a very well-known cast of characters. As you can see in the photograph of the dolphins here, every one of those is known to us. And they have histories that go along with them. We know their sex, we know their age, we know who they're related to, who they spend their time with, and a great deal more about each individual. The, probably the most important thing we learned over the course of, of time is that the dolphins truly are resident to the area. They live in a community of about 170 individuals, and that community inhabits the waters from southern Tampa Bay down to Venice Inlet and offshore to within a mile or so. There are other adjacent communities nearby. Within this local Sarasota community, there are at any given time up to five concurrent generations of related individuals. Once they're born into this community, they spend most of their time there. There's no wall holding anybody in. They can move around. They sometimes do move around and come back again. But it is a resident community of animals. We liken it to a neighborhood. And within this neighborhood and these many generations, we've had individuals up to 70, or up to 67 years of age in the case of females and 52 years in the case of males. So to put it into perspective, we find the Sarasota Bay community that we've been studying for so long has residency. The dots on the right-hand side are sightings of members of a five-generation maternal lineage, each different color is a different animal. They don't live in the same house. They don't necessarily swim together in the same families, but they live in the same neighborhood and they encounter each other. And there are comparable communities to the north in Tampa Bay. And when you get offshore, there's long-term residents offshore as well and to the south down at Charlotte Harbor. So the Sarasota dolphins are part of a mosaic of dolphin communities up and down the coast. And long-term residency has been documented first in Sarasota Bay, but we've seen it in other places as well. Being able to go out and predictably find the same individuals time and time again allows us to understand them. Some of the individuals we've seen more than 1,500 times over more than 40 years. So we can understand a little bit about their social structure. And so it was here in Sarasota Bay that we first were able to describe the social structure. And as much as many people would like to think about dolphins as being humans in wetsuits out there, they really do have their own way of doing things. They don't live in family units with mom, dad, and the kid. Mom raises the, off the offspring, all the dads are deadbeats. None of them take care of the kids at all. They don't live in pods. They live in very fluid groupings that change from minute to minute or hour to hour. Killer whales are a type of dolphin and they do live in pods because their social groups don't change. But bottomless dolphins are much more fluid. They're moving through the neighborhood, not moving with a particular clique up and down the street. But there are some basic groups. We see the nursery groups with the mothers and their most recent calves. They stay together for three to six years. We have juvenile groups of mixed sex. And then once they reach maturity, the adult males form this really cool uh, alliance that stays together for the life of the individuals that are involved. And that may improve their opportunities for survival and for, for breeding as well. One of the main foci of our work is understanding what it takes for a population of dolphins to survive and thrive. And it's become quite evident these animals face a variety of threats in the Gulf of Mexico. And they don't get to choose which of those threats they're going to face at any given time. They're faced with most of them all of the time. And so these are cumulative threats, they're concurrent threats, and they involve natural threats such as disease processes, Let's see if the mouse will work here. Yeah, so disease process, processes, failure to thrive, uh, predation pressure, stingray barbs, red tides are a major issue for them. Entanglement in fishing gear of all kinds, whether it's a net, which is not as common anymore with less net fishing going on, it never really was very common. Crab traps are an issue for these animals, but especially recreational fishing gear is a problem. People feeding dolphins is an issue. This is an illegal activity under the Marine Mammal Protection Act. It changes the animal's behavior and it makes about as much sense as what's going on here with this fellow and the bear. We find the boats are a threat to these animals, not just manatees, but about 5% of our dolphins have been hit by boat traffic. They face pollutants, they face noise from construction. They did not have oil from the Deepwater Horizon arrive, but it got within 80 miles and made us very concerned. They have to deal with climate change and hurricanes changing the, the nature of their environment. And we have to deal with the fact that these are very intelligent animals that learn and they teach their offspring. And so when the dolphins learn an inappropriate behavior like taking food from people, 
that behavior is passed along to the next generation. And the next generation faces the problems that come along with that. For example, in this particular lineage, everybody outlined in red is one who's had bad interactions or engages in bad behaviors relative to people. The bars, the slashes mean those animals actually died. And the pluses mean that they were injured. So once this gets established within a population from people either uh, directly feeding them or inadvertently feeding them with cast off fish or, or discarded fish, bad behaviors stay in place, the dolphins are attracted to people, and it leads to a variety of these other issues that these dolphins have to face. We've been able to develop a long enough and solid enough database for these animals that they can actually benefit dolphins in other places as well. We were the reference population for use in understanding what the health effects were and the, and the population dynamics effects from the Deepwater Horizon, where the, the long-term knowledge that we had was able to be used for comparing health parameters during these health assessment sessions. And by doing these comparisons, we were able to determine with our colleagues that the Barataria Bay and Louisiana dolphins that were heavily hit by Deepwater Horizon oil um, and didn't leave the area during the oil spill are five times more likely to have moderate to severe lung disease. They have disease conditions that are significantly greater in prevalence and consistent with what you would expect from exposure to oil and, tox and its toxicity. And most tellingly, they have very low reproductive success. Only 20% of the calves that were diagnosed with ultrasound appeared as live calves compared to 83% that we hear in Sarasota, we see here in Sarasota Bay. So this does not bode well for the future of the population. It's not a sustainable situation. But without the knowledge from a population that was unoiled like Sarasota Bay, the comparisons could not have been made and the case would not have been as strong in getting BP to settle. We also, while we engage in activities for conservation at the population level, we also recognize the importance of saving each individual in the area. We've learned over time that we can leverage additional individuals within the community by saving one individual. So when there are entangled animals uh, or other dolphins that require assistance being moved out of an inappropriate habitat or something like that, we're called upon by the National Marine Fisheries Service to engage in rescues, to lead rescue operations, working closely with marine laboratories, stranding investigation program, and other stranding partners up and down the coast. And in this way, we're able to rescue individuals that can then lead to their offspring being produced and being able to go on down the road. One of the ways this was driven home to me was in the bottom right-hand photograph. There are four mother calf pairs there from 2017. Three of the mothers in that picture had benefited from our interventions over the years. Three of the mothers and their three calves probably wouldn't have been in that photograph without human interventions. They probably wouldn't have been missing from the photograph if there hadn't been human activities of some kind, but at least there are mechanisms in place to try to make a difference for the animals should they get into, into trouble. And so we're very pleased that they're still around and still producing kids. And so with that, what I'd like to do is open things up for questions, but I do want to thank everyone who's made it possible for us to be able to, to do this work and to continue to do this work over the first 50 years. And we have every expectation of continuing into the next 50 years with the help of the folks that are listed here and others in your audience. Great. Thank you, Randy, for that overview. There's so, so much um, interesting information in there. And I think... What I'll do first is take a few of our audience questions and then I'll, I'll wrap back around uh, with a few things um, that we don't hit. So um, the first one we had was uh, from Ryan. This is a sort of long uh, question, so I'm going to put it up on the screen just for a moment here. Um, he is uh, wondering if there are resident non-migrating populations of bottlenose dolphins in many or, or even most uh, Bay areas? Sure, <clears throat> excuse me. What's been discovered over time is that there are resident populations of bottlenose dolphins in many coastal areas around the world. This was the first place that this was determined, but researchers are quite active in many other places around the US coastline and elsewhere in the world. And in most embayments, in warmer waters, you will find at least some portion of the, the dolphins to be long-term residents in that area. 
In the coastal waters, there are other individuals that will be moving along the coastline and don't show the same degree of residency. And in some situations, closer to the temperature limits of these animals, you'll find a mixture of residents and transients that move in and out of the area. So bottlenose dolphins, if there's one thing we've learned over time is that we have job security because there's no one answer for these animals. There's always something new to learn about them. They show us that in their many millions of years of existing on the face of the earth, they've developed a lot of different ways to be successful. And so ranging patterns is one of those. They're actually migratory in some parts of the species range. Along the Atlantic seaboard, they can be found as far north as Massachusetts or New Jersey in the summertime. But that range retracts down to North Carolina in the wintertime. Mm -hmm. And at the other extreme, you have the very tiny ranges, um, similar to what we see here in Sarasota, where generation after generation, they have this neighborhood that they inhabit. So it's a great question. And it, there's a lot of different ways the animals make a living. Great. Um, we had another question. This was one I had as well, actually, when I when I heard you mention this um, in your presentation, which is how noise pollution affects dolphins in the bay. That's a, a really good question. And hi, Diane. Um, the dolphins are affected by the noise that they hear in the bay. Throughout much of the world, marine mammals are faced with quite a variety of different kinds of sounds, and they can be very dangerous in some cases where you get the oil and gas exploration with, se with seismic exploration that can have very damaging effects on the animals. Military activity can have damaging effects. We're protected from those kinds of noises here in Sarasota Bay just because the water is so shallow. And shallow mm -hmm. water tends to attenuate sounds and the big ships that are involved in that can't get anywhere close to us. Yeah. But in Sarasota Bay, we have tens of thousands <coughs> of boats that are in the bay. And these, uh, these boats do put out noise. A hundred years ago, it was a much quieter environment out there. Mm -hmm. So among the things that we've tried to do over the years is understand how the dolphins respond to boat traffic. And we have learned that they do change their behavior as boats approach them. So as a boat is approaching within these dolphins, in some parts of the bay, there's a boat approaching within a hundred yards once every two minutes. In other parts of the bay, it's once every six minutes. And their behavior changes. First and foremost, they try to get out of the path of the boat. Oftentimes that involves diving. Oftentimes it involves them forming tight groups and they go quiet for a period of time, presumably because the sound of the boat going overhead is masking them and masking the sounds they produce. And it makes it more difficult for them to be able to communicate with one another. We've just recently started installing, well, within the last two years, installing a, a network of hydrophones, of underwater microphones yeah. at stations all around the, the bay. This is our passive acoustic listening station, station that Athena Rizik from New College will talk about in, in, in a while. But this allows us to monitor the presence of dolphins, the presence of, of boat, uh, boats passing by, and the fish sounds and invertebrate sounds of that area. And we're hoping to develop the ability to quantify the boat noise at these stations and track that over time and relate that to the presence of dolphins in the area. That's that's fascinating. I'm so excited to hear about that, to hear about more about that research um, uh, when Athena joins us uh, sometime next month. So um, let's see, we've got another one here from Ryan. He's wondering how much was uh, the Sarasota resident dolphin population affected by red tide? Um, bloom. Yeah, so there was a, a strong red tide that occurred in our study area from about uh, mid-summer of 2018 through January of 2019. And during that time, we lost at least four of our dolphins to the brevitoxins, to the neurotoxins that come with these red tides. And in addition, we saw more than 80% of the prey base for these dolphins be removed, whether it moved out of the area or mostly died as a result of the red tide being in the area. In 2005, 2006, we had a, a more severe red tide over a longer period of time. We saw over 90% of the prey fish that were lost as a result of that red tide. While none of our resident dolphins died from the brevitoxins themselves, we lost 2% of the population from ingesting fishing gear because they were going after the bait and catch on the end of fishing lines because there wasn't anything else for them. They were all, the anglers and the dolphins were concentrating on the same fish and it became a, a bad situation where the dolphins were attracted with humans and, and ended the lives of many of them. We were fortunate that that didn't happen with this most recent red tide. We did have some young dolphins that were entangled in fishing line, got wrapped around their tails and through their mouths. 
but we did not see the same mortalities from dolphins actually eating the fishing gear. Mm. And the fish population actually bounced back much more quickly after this most recent red tide. By the fall of last year, we were getting record catches or near record catches in our purse seine in Sarasota wow. Bay. And that's continued into the, the winter's fish surveys that we've been doing as well. So it had less of a long-term impact. It was pretty awful when it happened. It had a more severe impact from the toxins of the red tide itself. But we learned that each of these red tides are very different. Right. One of the other things we noted with that red tide in 2018 and 19 was that we saw a dramatic increase in the number of shark bites on our dolphins, fresh shark bites. Really? And this is not something we saw in 2005, 2006. In talking to our colleagues over at New College, Jane Gardner over at New College, and in looking at our own fishing data, one of the things that was pretty evident was that one of the main prey items for sharks was missing during and after the red tide. Rays were no longer in the waters at the levels that they used to be. Yeah. And so our hypothesis is that these sharks were looking at dolphins as an alternative food source. And not good for the dolphins, although they were not being stuck by stingrays, which is another one of those threats they have to face. So it was wow. not intended, it was not an expected consequence of the red tide, but as I said, we're learning more about these red tides with each one. Yeah, that's that's fascinating. And, and I'm wondering um, what types of fish, what types of, types of fish are you pulling up in these purse seines when you are looking for these dolphin prey items? Sure. The purse seine itself has a one inch mesh, so we're not getting anything much smaller than that. Mm -hmm. We've identified and worked with Nelio Barros, who used to be the Stranding Investigations Program Manager at Moat and who unfortunately passed away a few years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, we learned from his work what the dolphins eat in the Sarasota Bay Area by looking at stomach contents of stranded dolphins. And so we're monitoring all the fish that we catch in the purse seine, uh, but we're also specifically looking at quantifying the numbers of primary prey fish. And there's a list of 10 that we can, we can go through. But the primary one in terms of numbers that the dolphins eat are pinfish, and mm -hmm. it's one of the most abundant fish in the bay. I, I liken the pinfish to rice. They <laughs> fill up on that, but they select other kinds of fish specifically from the environment. They mm -hmm. go after things called soniferous fish, fish that produce noise themselves mm -hmm. selectively. They take them disproportionately to their availability in the environment. So mm -hmm. basically these animals, these dolphins that have such tremendous hearing capabilities, put those hearing capabilities to work to listen for their prey. They're not out there necessarily using their fantastic sonar system to scan the waters and look at fish and potentially tap them on the shoulder and say, hey, I know you're there. Instead, they listen for the fish and they zero in on them and they let the fish's own sounds bring them to them and basically hoist them by their own petard at that point. So wow. the kinds of fish that make noise are croakers mm -hmm. and toadfish are really good at doing that sort of thing. And yeah. a, a variety of uh, sea trout are another species. So their diet is a mixture of these, but given the opportunity, they select these soniferous fish disproportionately. That's so interesting. Um, and, and let's see, you, you mentioned these shark bites, um, which is related to this question. Um, which is, what is a dolphin's most dangerous predator? In Sarasota Bay, well, it varies from place to place, but in Sarasota Bay, we believe the bull sharks are probably the primary predator of the dolphins. Mm -hmm. And we have one of our staff members, Dr. Kristen Wilkinson, who's looking at the movements of bull sharks and relating that and the ecology of the bull sharks to the ecology of the dolphins as well. Mm -hmm. Though they are seasonally abundant in the area and mm -hmm. Their abundance dropped dramatically starting in the 70s with overfishing of shark populations along the coast, mm -hmm. and they very slowly have been coming back. Great, thank you. Um, let's see. Great, we've got, we've got about four more questions here. These are fantastic. Um, here's a quick one for you. Do dolphins mate year-round? Do dolphins mate year-round? They mate year-round, they mate all day long, they, uh, they mate at all ages. Um, mm -hmm. There is a breeding seasonality for when those matings actually make a difference for procreation. Okay. And the primary calving season is May, June, July. We're in the height of it right now. We've seen a couple of calves so far this year. But my my major professor at University of California, Santa Cruz, a guy named Ken Norris, who's one of the grandfathers of environmental science, 
I used to talk about how dolphins use sex like we use a handshake, or at least before COVID, how we used to use a handshake. And it, it's one of the means they have for being able to interact with one another and, and develop and maintain relationships. So their sexual interactions have no limits. And it's part of their social milieu in terms of how they build and, and maintain these relationships. But there are truly times when it makes a difference. And this time of year, with a 12 and a half month gestation period, is when we see most of the, the active procreation going on. Great. Um, let's see, here's a fun one. Um, what's been your favorite discovery about the behavior of Sarasota Bay's uh, dolphin population? I, I have to go with the idea of learning that they're my neighbors was mm. the big one. Knowing that I could go out there and find the same individuals day after day, mm. year after year, decade after decade. I, I'm more familiar with dolphins in the area than I met when I was here in the 70s than I am in touch with high school kids that I was in school with at Riverview back then. Uh -huh. uh, it, it truly did establish the opportunity to learn so much about these animals, to be able to have the opportunity the privilege to be able to follow individuals through time and learn about the dramas that go on in their lives, learn about their relationships, learn about what's important to them. Um, none of that would have been possible without these animals staying in the area and allowing us to be able to approach them to learn about them. That's wonderful. I, I love that answer. Um, uh, let's see. Um, here's one. What's the minimum size of a population um, to maintain genetic diversity? And uh, is, is there a mechanism for ensuring dolphins don't mate with close relatives? Those are really good questions and we don't have answers to all of those. Mm -hmm. What we do know is that the communities are not closed genetic units. They're not closed breeding units. So we, that's why we refer to them as communities as opposed to a population, which is more constrained as, as being an independent reproductive unit. So we do see genetic mixing going on between communities along the west coast of Florida. So there's not too much concern there. Mm -hmm. In terms of how we they don't mate with close relatives, we don't know the answer to that. There is some suspicion that it may be because they know them well enough because of the ability to recognize their signature whistles, their names, for example, that they're able to maintain um, distance from one another when it comes to mating opportunities and not interact in that way. But having said that, I mean, as I mentioned before, there are no bounds for when, for mating that would be occurring. The young calves are known to mate with their mothers from time to time when they're just a few weeks old. Again, it's not a procreational activity, so it doesn't lead to inbreeding kinds of things. But it's there are, are these differences in, in how we refer to how they have interaction sexually. Mm -hmm. Really interesting. Um, let's see, we've got just a couple more here. Uh, this one is from, from Allie, um, submitting a question on behalf of Bryce and Coco. And they're wondering if it's possible to identify dolphins and learn more about the individuals. And if that information is available, I guess, for the public somewhere to be able to identify the dolphins. Yeah, that, that information isn't available publicly. Uh, and one of the reasons is um, has to do with the fact that these animals are protected. We operate out there under a federal permit under the Marine Mammal Protection Act, and we are not in a position to encourage people to approach dolphins to identify them. Mm -hmm. Approaching closer than 50 yards is not something that's allowed under the Marine Mammal Protection Act, but our permit allows us to get closer to get those photos. Mm -hmm. So if there's a, one or two photos that you get without approaching the animals, and you have a question about who that animal is, then we can try to to answer your question from that photo, as long as we don't get overwhelmed. But um, it really is important to recognize that we are sharing the waters with these animals. They were living here before we were. We're all gonna share the waters, we all have an interest in the waters, but we need to respect the waters as their home and respect the protective measures that are in place to allow them to carry on their lives without, without being concerned about what's going to happen with boats approaching them. Absolutely. Um, I think I'll do one last audience audience question, and then I've got a couple of my own to wrap up with, if that's okay with you. Um, in my heart. <laughs> let's see. Okay, uh, here's one last one from Ryan, who, um, let's see. 
it looks like you saw a documentary you were in. Maybe you can you can probably address this question pretty well. Sure. Okay. We've been we've been working with scientists from Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution and the University of St Andrews over in Scotland on communication processes in dolphins for quite some time. And the fact that we know each of the dolphins in the bay and know their backgrounds, who they're related to, who they spend time with, allowed these scientists to under to be able to design experiments to understand what the sounds that they make. They produce a wide variety of sounds. There's the echolocation clicks, the sonar we talked about before. They produce raspberry sounds that are among my favorites that are used in socializing. <laughs> And then they produce whistles. And they can produce an infinite variety of whistles, but they produce one particular kind of whistle. Each individual has its own whistle that's called a signature whistle. And it produces that more often than any other. In experiments that have been done with gently holding the dolphins in the water during a health assessment and playing recorded whistles from other dolphins back to them and looking at how they respond, the scientists were able to determine that they responded much more strongly to the whistles of their relatives and their close associates. Mm -hmm. They then went to the next step and didn't just play back the recorded whistles, but they went through a, a filtration process where they stripped out the voice information. Just mm -hmm. like I could recognize you, Darcy, from both the sound of your voice and from you saying your name. Mm -hmm. um, they took out that and had computer generated whistles that just had the shape of the whistle contour. And the dolphins responded in the same way which led these scientists to conclude that the dolphins were actually responding to the abstract concept of a name. Wow. That this, this is something they recognize. And so it's used by the individuals to let others know where they are. It's a contact kind of call. Others can call to them with that name and allow them to come together. The waters in Sarasota Bay are incredibly productive and we love that about them. They're also very murky because they're so productive. We don't love that about them. But it means that the dolphins have to can't really use vision to keep in touch with one another. They really have to rely on acoustics. And so these signature whistles are one way that they have of maintaining cohesion, maintaining contact or gaining contact with one another. And it also um, means that sounds are really important to them and we need to do what we can to not interfere with the transmission of those sounds between the individuals. Uh -huh. is, is that uh, one of the things you're looking at in terms of the, the acoustic network um, is, is communication among animals, not just identifying where they are, but maybe how they're communicating? Yeah, uh, being able to do that, once we have enough stations in place, we have, I don't want to steal Athena's thunder here, but we have 10 stations in, in place now. And we are just getting to the point with analyses that have been developed by a master's student at New College to be able to pull whistles out of all the sounds that are recorded at a station and be able to match them to the catalog mm -hmm. of signature whistles. So the ability is there now to, soon anyway, to be able to track individuals from their signature whistles from one station to the next and be able to look at who they're with mm -hmm. if they're whistling as well. Mm -hmm. So without ever being out on the water, we can go to the cloud and download sounds and understand a bit about their social interactions in that way and look at how those sounds may change in the presence of boat activity or fish presence. That's, that's so cool. Um, and you know, talking a little bit more broadly about, about Sarasota Bay, this is my last question for you. Um, dolphins are sometimes called sentinel species, mm -hmm. right? Meaning that they by studying them, we can better understand um, their environments, the risks in their environments that might affect um, other animals or even even humans. Um, can you tell us maybe just your thoughts on how studying bottlenose dolphins in Sarasota Bay has improved our understanding of the bay as an entire ecosystem? Sure. Um, these dolphins are, are top predators, mm -hmm. uh, meaning they, they eat at the top of the food chain. They are eating other fish that prey on other fish that prey on invertebrates and go and on down. They're large mammals, they live in localized waters. And so we've been fortunate to be able to get support from the Baransic Foundation to be able to monitor these animals as sentinels of ecosystem health because they are at the top level of marine ecosystem. These dolphins and the humans that use these waters share a variety of things. We breathe the same air, we swim in the same waters, we catch and eat the same fish. And so recognizing the dolphins do those things, but they do them more than we do. They're bigger than we are. 
they're in the water all the time rather than just part of the time. They're surviving on just fish. Mm -hmm. All these things, given those factors with these large mammals living in our backyard or we're living in, the, in their backyard, depending on how you look at it, things that happen to them are going to happen first. And then those same sorts of things can happen to us. They are, I don't want to call them canaries because they aren't, but they mm -hmm. are an indicator of what could be happening in the ecosystem, which could affect humans as mm -hmm. well. And of course, we don't want it to ever get that far where it really becomes an issue of them detecting something that we really have to worry about mm -hmm. by monitoring them, by developing the means for detecting things early on, by working to create a happy, healthy ecosystem for them, then we benefit from all of that automatically. And so the more we can do to recover and maintain Sarasota Bay mm -hmm. as the ecosystem that it was and it could be, it's everybody benefits. Great. And I think that leads us into a pretty good last question. Um, sorry, I think my audio is echoing a little bit here. But um, that being, you know, what are the maybe the top two things that people can do uh, to help protect dolphins and the, the greater Sarasota Bay ecosystem from your point of view? Sure. Well, first of all, I need to appreciate and enjoy Sarasota Bay. It's an amazing area. My family moved here in 1969. It's home. I love it down here. But part of that appreciation comes with understanding the things that can threaten it and the things that, that you can do to try to reduce the risk to the damage. So number one is respect the wildlife that's out there. It needs to make a living. It has no other place to go. The people have alternatives. They respect your neighbors in the water. And that respect extends beyond just being out on the water as well. Uh, we've been able to document through our studies some of the effects of contaminants that we've been able to track from upland sources into Sarasota Bay. What happens at the edge of a creek miles away from Sarasota Bay can impact Sarasota Bay itself. The pesticides, the fertilizers, any of those changes that get into the water that drains into Sarasota Bay can mm -hmm. put pollutants in the water that can directly harm the animals. Or in the case of, of things like nitrogen pollution, it can enhance the nutrients that are available for things like red tide to take effect or hang around longer and make it worse for the dolphins and for us as well. So thinking about how we impact the bay, even when we're not, when we're not out on the bay, what we can do to make it a better place benefits all of us. Great. I, I, uh, I think that's a really wonderful message to leave off on, especially that part about getting to know our bay better. Um, it's, it is really truly a beautiful place and I'm wondering, this is really my last question for you. Do you have a favorite, do you, do you have a favorite part of the of the Sarasota Bay area, all the way from, you know, uh, Anna Maria Sound down to the Venice Inlet? Oh, I'm going to make somebody unhappy if I say anything, but I moved to Siesta Key. I still live on Siesta Key, and so the Wonderful. waters around Siesta Key truly feel like home to me. Mm -hmm. Beautiful, beautiful. I love those those back smaller bay uh, ecosystems back behind, behind Siesta. They're so special. Yeah, um, and um, well, with that, uh, Randy, I want to thank you so much for joining me today. Um, this was a really fun session. I loved learning more about uh, your team's work, about the dolphins that are our neighbors uh, in Sarasota Bay. And I want to thank our audience as well for uh, sending up some really wonderful questions. Um, so with that, um, I think we will end this broadcast. And what I'll do is put a few links into the comments section of this video uh, so that you all can go find out some more information about the Dolphin Research Program and all the wonderful things that they are uh, learning about our Bay ecosystem. Great, thank you, Darcy. And on behalf of the Chicago Zoological Society, we appreciate the opportunity to get the word out about our neighbors. Anytime, thanks again for joining me. And uh, everyone, I'll be back here again next Tuesday. Uh, with Dr. Megan Ellers, who is uh, who runs the Carefree Learner boat. She's also a Sarasota High School marine biology teacher. Um, she actually told me that she will be on the boat during the interview um, next uh, next Tuesday, June 2nd. So that'll be a great one to see um, how Sarasota County students get to use this boat uh, to learn more about the waters of Sarasota Bay. So I hope to see you again. I hope to see you then on Tuesday. And thanks again for joining us. Bye bye.